ladies and gentlemen, welcome Rod to the pod. <sighs> Yay. Psh. I'm wild. Bam, 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 bam. This is for people listening. Rod looked behind him and was like, who, who are we talking about? I don't, yeah, I don't. <laughs> I'm just here to say I'm just fine. That's it. So we have new Deal Donation men's coach, Rod. Rod, please pronounce your last name for me because I do not know how to pronounce it. Strozier or Strozier if you want to be fancy. I think I'm going to change it once I hit 50. To Strozier full time. Strozier, yes. And just yeah. correct everybody. It's going to be great. <laughs> I'm always going to call it a Strozier now. Yes, I love it. I already have one on board. Nice. Oh, yeah. No, I think that's how after this podcast, everyone's going to say Rod Strozier. Uh, we already thought you had a badass name, Rod, badass energy. But now we know you have a badass last name, too. Oh man, stop it. I, I can't I can't take this much flattery and awesomeness. You're just <laughs> well, yeah, the team, <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, for those listening, we're gonna dive into not only Rod and him being the newest member of the men's team, rounding us out in a really nice way, but we've also been told that we have a very unique, we're we're very unique men as it pertains to coaching. Because I think the three of us here, we all have coached men and women. And that kind of takes a, a special talent, we've been told, because on that spectrum of a guy from the macho bullshit to is he gay, I think the three of us are like closer to the is he gay side. And that Spencer's cracking up. That can allow, feel free to borrow that. And everybody listening, feel free to borrow that as well. Yeah. And that's, that's basically the three of us. And it's been funny because when Dayla and I first started this, uh, she was like, I feel like you can coach women. And then it was like, man, we're going to have a really hard time finding another dude who uh, won't be creepy and won't be weird when doing a check-in, right? And then Spencer comes into our life as part of the Maddie Spencer couple dream team superhero squad. And then all of a sudden we found Rod and we are so lucky, so fortunate. So this episode is going to be diving into a little bit about how we got here. So I'm going to kick it off with Rod because you're the new one. Um, what, what are some comments that you've gotten over the years about the type of man that you are? Ooh, that... Great, great question. I like that. Um, honestly, it is. So something that you guys have noticed is energy. I feel like that is like a huge one that um, really stems from me being back in high school. And it stems from making the best out of any situation possible. And once I learned that, once I began to actually dissect that and understand it, and then also implement it in my life, like in an everyday practice, then the energy just started to build. It just continues to grow. And whenever I feel low energy, I still allow myself to, to feel that way. But I always remember, I'm like, hey, like, it's okay to feel this way, but also make the best out of every situation. So it is me being always positive and everybody wondering, why the fuck am I always smiling? They're like, why? Why are you always smiling? I'm like, should, should I not, <laughs> you know? Um, and those are like some of the biggest ones that continually um, stand out and that always seem to find me no matter where I go or who I'm speaking with and that I'm always thankful for and always slightly bashful at the same time. Have you gotten the same reaction from your clients? Because anytime Rod sends us a voice memo, Spencer and I are blown away because it could be 7 a.m. It could be midnight, same type of energy. So have you had clients kind of say the same thing? Uh, yes, I have. Yeah. And it, they, it's really nice to get such of like a positive feedback of just an overwhelming thanks of just support and just being like, thank you for just being just, just really excited and really motivating me and just continuing to push me. And I feel like the energy also plays into how you just deliver information because you can, you can talk about something that is difficult, but if you have the right energy, you have the right tone, you learn to apply that. And you can turn a, you know, a bad situation or, you know, a less than good situation into kind of like a positive highlight with the right amount of energy. And I just continue to learn that and hear that as well. I completely agree. And you got me thinking, Rod, for the way that we all do check-ins, whether it's a man, a man, a male on the team or a woman on the team, it's the different type of energy and kind of how things are said. And regardless of sex, regardless of gender, there are times as coaches, we need to sometimes give tough love. And there's times where we need to be a little softer and being able to go back and forth within sort of that energy spectrum. 
Spencer, kind of same question. What have been comments you've gotten about the type of guy that you are? Because we'll get into a little bit of our backgrounds, but Spencer, I know you probably played football um, because I I was a swimmer and, you know, hanging out in our Speedos, we don't sometimes get the like manly man ethos. And Spencer, I'm sure you've gotten that. But then when you meet, when someone meets you, you kind of buck that trend. So what what have people said to you about the type of man that you are? Yeah. So uh, unlike Rod, I'm not always smiling. Um, That was actually like, I smile a lot more uh, over the past few years. I feel like the 20 something version of me who was playing football is very different than the 30 year old version of me. Um, A lot of that has to do, I think with since meeting Maddie, Um, she's definitely brought a much more positive energy into my life. And then of course, joining DLD nation, I I feel like those two people would be very confused as who they're meeting. If they were to meet each other, you know, uh, that 20 year old version of me, but the most common thing I got was like, wow, you're, very different. Like you're not this high end macho man, even though you're six foot four at the time, like 300 pounds, like I would get told, like, you're you're really soft. Like you're just not, you're not aggressive. It's like, it's not my personality. Like my dad was always super aggressive. I didn't really find that to fit me very well. So it was always like almost confusion to when people would meet me, they see this big, what looked like a big beard, you know, hair was okay, I guess, but like big beard, big body man, you know, walking through, they'd think either, you know, intimidating, you know, just this big person. And then they're like, oh, wow, he's so dainty. Like, <laughs> he's just not, you know, he's not overpowering by any means. And it was always like, uh, just like confusion about me. Like, honestly, there was a point in time where I definitely got more of that. Is he gay conversation? Um, that was a lot through high school for me. But as I got older and I started to, you know, uh, surround myself around the right people, and really, I feel like it's like the past like three, four years where I put myself in that position, I found myself being a lot more understanding, a lot more, you know, accepting of like, hey, I'm a big guy, but it's okay that I'm a big guy who like likes to cry a little bit, who likes sentimental things, who likes to be hugged, who is okay with telling people he loves them, hugging his men friend and telling them he loves them, like, wow, I'm actually okay with being that person. All right, I'm just gonna lean into that. And it's so much easier for me to be like, hey, Sean, hey, Rod, I love you guys. I appreciate who you guys are versus being like, yeah, oh, whatever, bro. It's cool. It's just like, it's easier for me to do that. And it doesn't mean like I'm any different of a person. It's just, but this is just easy. It's easy. Like Rod was saying, it's easier for him to just be positive and look at the the brighter side of things and look at that better perspective versus just sitting in that like, Meh mood you know so that's um that's probably one of the confusion was really the biggest thing i got out of people was just like unsure of like which direction are you going man you're so big but so soft that was the greatest like whatever bro accent i don't think i've ever (laughs) heard that from you that was fantastic usually i I get the i get the way more like you're gay like even dayla when we first met because i have uh, an equality sign on my ring finger so she saw that at the gym and she, I saw her eyes go down to it. And then it came back up to me and she was like, are you gay? And I could tell she was like, am I wasting my time here talking to you? Also funny story, uh, an old friend of mine named Dash, uh, who's also gay. He, I was at like a birthday party with him way back when in Austin, like back when I was single. And he told me, he was like, hey, I have another friend named Sean who's at this party and he thinks we're a couple. And he's like, beef. he tells me that he doesn't like you because he thinks that you're trying to hit on me. And he was like, can you at some point mention that you're straight. And so Sean and I, I see Rod, so we're going to come back for that story. I see him kind of rolling his eyes. And so I go to Sean and I'm like, hey, what's up, man? Da, 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 da. And then at some point I was like, hey, you know, I'm straight, right? And he's sort of like, you could see him sort of relax. And he was like, wow, like I, I didn't know. And I he was like, I kind of thought you might be gay. And I said, yeah, it's because I take care of myself and I like have a sharp line on my beard and I, you know, dress nicely. And he goes, and isn't that fucked up? that I thought you were gay just because you're a man who takes care of himself. Uh, and that one, that one always stuck with me. Uh, but I've never really gotten the like, occasionally when I was playing basketball, like it would come out. I'm not, I wasn't the biggest shit talker growing up, but if someone started talking shit to me, like I'm, I'm going to respond growing up in Los Angeles, you kind of have to, to defend yourself, but it wasn't sort of my, my mode coming out of the gate. And so Rod, I want to touch on that eye roll when you were talking about the experience as is he, is he not, And then I'm also curious because remind me, like, did you play sports? So first question, that eye roll. And then second question, you being in the military, I was shocked at how sort of seemingly, and this is my fault, you know, I'm I'm stereotyping, but how in touch with your feelings you are. So the eye roll first, and then did you play sports? You know, what was sort of your background? Oh, man, we're going to unpack some shit. This is great. 
Um, <laughs> Welcome to the show, bro. <laughs> I fucking love this. This is one of many. This is going to be, oh my God. Uh, okay, so first off, the eye roll. That is fucking hilarious because I get that a lot. Once again, very similar to you guys. Like, hey, I take care of myself. I like to look nice. Like, I wear a lot of jewelry, you know, um, especially rings. And how I carry myself as well. And I'm just generally just like a nice person, you know, and I'm always smiling. So if I see somebody and I make, and I make eye contact with you and I smile, sometimes it can be misleading where I'm just being like, hey, I see you make eye contact with me. Like, I'm just being friendly. And then I don't know what it is, but like sometimes when I'm out with Erica, my girlfriend, we'll just have somebody like looking me up and down. And usually it's a, it's another individual who I might presume is, is gay. And sometimes they walk up to me and they're like, oh, you know, I like your shirt or I like this and whatever, whatever. And then Erica will come back and see me talking to this random man. And then he'll look at me and look at her and try to figure out the same situation. Like, what is the dynamic here? And I'm like, oh, this is my girlfriend, Erica. And he's like, girlfriend. And he's like, so are you, are you bi? And I'm like, I'm like, no, I'm <laughs> no, like, this is my girlfriend, Erica. Oh, he's like, oh, I totally thought that you were gay and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, but thank you. I appreciate it. You know? And it's just, yes. So I feel like that happens. Um, yeah. I feel like that happens more often than I would think that it should, but it is what it is. I take it as a compliment. Real quick interjection. Isn't it screwed up that the assumption of any sort of compliment from a man to a man is like either, you know, oh, this person's coming on to me or what's going on. Like, and I see you guys all like agree, not in agreement. I have a really great friend who I grew up with, Dalton Talent, shout out to him. And when I was living in LA, like he would come up to you to party and be like, bro, I love that shirt. Or like, bro, I love your vibe. Or like, oh man, your shoes are popping off. And we would all joke amongst our friends because we've all known each other since preschool. And we'd be like, is DT fucking with us? Like, is he, is this a real true compliment or is he trying to get something out of us? Um, so it's just, yeah, funny that happens. Um, but yeah, Rod, tell us a little bit about your background. You play sports like Spencer or me? Yes. So I actually, I tried playing football. So I played football for two years in high school. So freshman, senior year. Um, it wasn't freshman, it was, senior off, year. So I'm we sorry, gotta, freshman, freshman and sophomore, sophomore? year. Okay. That, was, that was a big jump. Big jump. I was going to yeah, say freshman, he was freshman year. year and like, Rod probably did something really cool and then was like, I retire. And then senior year, they're like, we need you to come back, bro. No, right. It was not like that. I sucked. No, it was, it was absolutely terrible. I had no idea what was going on. I couldn't be offense because I had no idea how to read plays. Like people would just take off running and I'm like, do you want, do you want me to go? Which, which, oh shit. Yeah. So instead I was just a free safety. I just backpedaled and I just like look for the ball. And that was the easiest thing to do, but it wasn't, it wasn't my, my, my crowd. Like I was probably a hundred and shit 150 pounds maybe 145 pounds I didn't work out in high school um I had probably played t-ball I played baseball for 15 years growing up played that all the way through high school um so baseball was my kind of like not very masculine but it just felt natural it felt you know like hey you know yeah I play baseball I don't have to be super masculine to play it it wasn't um the same kind of like vibe as like a football locker room you know what I mean um, you had like what, like the dugout talk, you know, but that was pretty much it. But where I really kind of like flourished was tennis. And that was something that caught me off guard. So I played four years of tennis all the way through high school. And it was one of those things where nobody like was there to prove themselves. So I went from being in this atmosphere of like football, um, baseball, which was like, didn't really cross the line of like too much masculine, too much feminine. And then I played tennis and everybody was just there to like have a good time and just participate. You know what I mean? Um, wrestling was another one that I did for a little bit for a few years that also had those kind of tendencies of like, Hey, I'm just here to like fuck people up and like, I'm a man, blah, 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 you know? Um, and then when I got into, when I got into college, I did four years of track and field. And once again, that was, I feel like even more open because um, I feel like it was more balanced between men and women. And once again, we were there to have a good time and we were there to perform and we were actually all friends. It was actually the um, kind of like what you would expect an ideal team or a team atmosphere to, to feel like. So, yeah, so that's, that's, my, that's my sports history, I would say. 
I love it. It also reminded me, and I think you make a good point, Rod, and I'm going to kick it to you, Spencer, here in a sec. Uh, growing up as a competitive swimmer from the age of seven and being around women who were in bathing suits. And so not only am I with guys who are in Speedos, but I'm also with women who are in one piece, but then in the summers in LA, like they would go to the two piece because we're swimming outside, like they're getting a tan. And it, I, I know, made me really comfortable with women because to your point, Rod, like track and field and swimming are very similar because it's not a did you win question. It's a how did you do? Like, did you, you know, get better, your personal best, whatever it is. And then the time between events. So like you go to a track meet, you go to swim meet, you're like, all right, I got four events today and it's going to be an entire day. And so I'm going to be hanging out with the girls and the guys and just kind of shooting the shit in between. And as you say that, that sort of uh, cues me into like one reason why I think women have been more comfortable with me. It's because I've grown up with them and in, in a, and you know, track and field is this way too, because you're, you're, uh, you want less drag. And so sort of the outfits are going to be a little bit more revealing. And so I noticed even in high school, guys would be a little nervous around girls and they're like, how are you so uh, not nervous seemingly? And I'm like, well, I've, you know, since I was like seven, eight years old, I've basically been with women in, in bathing suits. And so I'm curious with Spencer, as you look back on your life too, can you sort of pinpoint also, uh, you know, I'd love for you to dive into like your journey in therapy as well, but how, what, what were some of those things that you think if you look back have helped you be a really great coach for men and women? I mean, so much of it, I guess, is, is boils onto experience, you know, like, uh, as you mentioned, like just getting practice in those situations, whether you knew it was practice or not, you know, I never, you know, growing up, you know, from elementary school to, high school um and and beyond even like workplaces i never found myself being like the bro bro right look but i could blend in right i i could you know if you need me to be that bro i can i can be your bro but at the same time i always had that emotional intelligence to have a genuine conversation with like a female coworker or a friend in high school who's having a tough time like i didn't know what advice i was giving but i understood that you know this person was struggling with something whether it was male or female and like I was comfortable enough to talk to them through it and just be someone to listen to them. And as that continued on, you know, in relationships, that was always helpful because I wasn't, you know, quick to snap or quick to be this macho alpha man that had to, you know, peacock everywhere. Um, I was able to just, you know, kind of be the sensitive one, if you will, in, in relationships. And I didn't know for a while that would kind of be my downfall until I actually finally met Maddie, where it was like, she appreciates the fact that like, I don't act, you know, all macho. And a lot of it, once again, was just seeing how my dad did things, right? My dad was the macho man. My dad, like, you know, a very like 1950s type of guy, you know, and he just, that's like the best way I can think of it. And I saw, I just didn't really serve him very well. You know, it's watching from people around, seeing how, guys my own age were, were treating women and like I'd be the one listening to it you know I worked uh if you guys worked in restaurants especially as a server you see a lot more I think in my experience a lot more women servers than you do male servers um and I would always see you know my female co-workers getting like emotionally bullied by these men and then I'd be there and you know just listen be like oh, dude that sucks like super tough like I don't know what to tell you and you know their boyfriends or ex-boyfriends were like oh is, is that the gay server it's like <laughs> why because i can just listen and and not judge or not try to sleep with everyone that i work with i think that was a big thing too i i lived by don't shit where you eat right like i did not do any of that stuff so there was always that assumption there but it was really for me it was just allowing myself to not really like always be the bro bro allow myself to you know be friends with kind of everybody i kind of like rod rod came across as willing and able to be friends with literally everyone you came across and there was no like unless uh, emotions got deeper or something like that there was no weirdness right like my best friend growing up who you guys were both me she's a girl you know i've known her since i was two i remember when i first started dating maddie she's like your best friend's a girl i'm like yeah uh, i'm like no 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 like total sister situation like no nothing like that like and then she meets her and she's like oh no yeah no I I get it yeah no you get it's it's cool like it's not weird at all right and I've always tried to do that and now it really like the biggest test was when I got to work for DLD Nation of like hey all that stuff you didn't really realize you were learning we're gonna go ahead and apply it you know thankfully both uh Sean you and Dela saw like hey 
this guy has that. You can see it in his eyes. Like he's got that ability. Let's test it out. And thankfully it worked out really well. You know, I had the opportunity or I still have the opportunity to work with, you know, basically a 50, 50 roster of both men and women. And I, I can confidently say I've never had a client be like, Spencer's kind of weird. Spencer's kind of creepy. Like, <laughs> thank God, because that would crush me. Like, I never want to, I never want to make anyone feel uncomfortable or weird, especially in this setting. Right. So really it for me, more than anything, it was just the experiences through life and unconsciously practicing on being a decent human uh, as much as I could learning from other people's, I guess you could say downfalls or their mistakes. So I don't make those mistakes. And it kind of just put me into this place where I, I feel a lot more comfortable with my emotions. And there was definitely a gap in time, I'd say in my early 20s to now, early to like late 20s before I met Maddie, where a lot of this inner work was, was too frou-frou for me. Like I was, hey guys, I'm still a dude, right? I can't do that stuff. So I didn't get really in touch deeply with like my emotions, that that kid inside of me until I started working for DLD Nation and, and really connecting more with you, Sean. Um, and of course, Maddie and, and just this environment of like, hey, it's it's cool to, it's it's totally cool to cry as, as a grown man. It's it's totally cool to be sad as a grown man. Um, and it's cool to like talk about it as a grown man. So I will say so much of my development as a guy who's in touch with his feelings, like I feel like both of you, uh, this has been like a long-term like who you are as human beings from like day one, if you will, to now. Whereas for me, so much of my growth has come really in the past two to three years um, here at like late in life, if you will, but being so okay with this is who I'm supposed to be. Like, I feel very comfortable like in this skin and this person of like, hey, I can be bros, but I can I can be, you know, bros with the girls too, right? Like everyone's everyone's my friend and there's no, yeah. I'm also going to shout you out, Spencer, for being willing to go on that journey and being willing to learn maybe at an older age. Um, and of course, everyone listening knows we're huge fans of therapy and the three of us should probably get t-shirts that say like, I cry too, the next time we all get together. I'm sensing a theme that, because Spencer, even though you said, you know, a lot of your growth has come recently, you're in the server life and with a lot of women and me growing up swimming with a lot of women, Spencer, or uh, Rod rather running track, uh, tennis, of course, can be co as well. And so being around a lot of women. And so Next sort of topic, I'm curious, Rod, did you grow up with examples of strong women in your life? And uh, we'll kind of go around the horn with this because I think we're, we're getting to the bottom of uh, what's made us who we are. I love that. Definitely. I believe that the person who obviously always stands up is, is my mother. And till this day, I still will go to her for anything that I possibly need. Um, it's, it's one of those things where she was always my mentor she was always my coach she was always there for like the tough love and like she would call me out of my bullshit and be like hey like you are capable of doing so much more so like you need to you need to live up to that potential but also understanding that i needed to grow in my own way and she would allow me to do so she would allow me to uh you know make those mistakes she would allow me to um, just kind of like figure out my own path and then support me on that path while also being like, Hey, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Um, but I really feel that like when my parents divorced, I had a strained relationship with my father for like 10 years. So I was really only talking to my mom for all of my advice. And when I wasn't talking to her, then I was either trying to figure it out on my own or just partying my ass off in fucking college and just being a complete idiot, you know? So I felt like as I grew older, I began to, to really understand the importance of having that, that strong woman in your life. And then I started to realize how much she actually shapes who I am right now. And I also believe that that is a, a large reason that I am the way that I am. And I, and I understand that balance between not having to defend my fucking, like me being a man to anyone, you know, and me being okay with just, you know, crying or um, failing or all of these other traits that tend to be um, not living up to like what a man is. So yeah, but definitely till this day, still my mom. 
I can definitely attest. And I love that Rod and appreciate you sharing shout out to your mom as well. Um, I can attest my mom was really open with my emotions and encouraged them and was like, it's okay to cry. And that means that you care. And like, that's a good thing. And I also think of my grandparents, my dad's mom. So my, my dad's parents, my grandfather was a truck driver. So he was gone a lot. And my grandmother was holding down the fort and she was also an accountant. And she was really influential in shaping my dad uh, because they had a lot of time together. And she also got a basketball scholarship back when it was six on six and you could only dribble three times. You had to do something with it. The guards and forwards couldn't pass half court. You played offense or defense and she got a scholarship for college and then got pregnant with my uncle and couldn't do that. Uh, But she was such a huge, really strong presence. And then my mom's mom being full Korean and the first in her family born in the United States, that was a huge one. She tells all these stories about the melting pot and um, of course, you know, looking different than people uh, she grew up with. And then a story that I often tell is she was refused service in a restaurant in Georgia for being Korean. And thankfully, my grandfather's just like, we don't like the food here, we're going to leave. But through that process, she was able to share a lot of that strength with me. And then like, surprise, surprise, I end up with a woman like Dela, really strong in that way as well. And so Spencer, in addition to because I didn't know this about you, your best friend, being a woman. Um, and of course, then you become attracted to Maddie, who, you know, is taking care of business in so many ways. And so do you have other uh, women in your life that that were an example of that strong female? Absolutely. Uh, actually, a quick little fun fact <clears throat> that you shared. Uh, you also received in that same state the author, uh, author Ash Award uh, for uh, for your work as a swimmer and in the community, right? This is true. Yeah, it's nice of you. You were also nice because and I think it's for people who watch a lot of college football and like college sports, because when I mentioned being an Arthur Ashe Sports Scholar Award, you were like, wait a minute, like that's a big award, like you had to have done something. And it was so huge for my grandmother, because yeah, like my uh, mom, it was kind of a military kid. So they bounced around and uh, her high school years were in Philadelphia. And so they drove from Philly down to Alabama to visit uh, like an uncle of hers on, on her dad's side and on the way down through Georgia, that's where they were like, yeah, we're not going to feed you guys. And so then fast forward two generations and I win this award partly because I'm Korean. Um, you know, it was so, so big for my grandmother. And then Georgia does this great thing with athletes when they graduate, there's like a breakfast before graduation and the athletic directors there and like your coaches are there, et cetera. And my mom cried in front of the athletic director, athletic director, director and assistant AD and was like, this is so huge for our family. I think it also is a little, a little bit of a conversation of progress of like, okay, two generations ago, this person wasn't allowed in restaurants. And then two generations forward, this person's being celebrated for the same thing in the same state. I think it's super cool. So I appreciate that, Spencer. For sure. I thought it was such a cool story when you said it. And yeah, to your point, when you, right when you said you got that reward, I was like, dude, how, how much cooler can this guy get? Um, so for me, I definitely had a lot of, I had, it was a group effort, if you will, in, in my, um, uh, strong women in my life. You know, <clears throat> during my influential years, Rod Berry, some of you, my parents got divorced. My father was actually in prison and in high school, my mom just kind of didn't, I don't want to say didn't care because I don't know that depth, but just wasn't there. Right. So I had to kind of lean on a lot of other people and I didn't know I had to lean on them for support. So it was a combination, of course, of like my aunt who was always going to be a ride or die for me, but past that like she had her own life she had her own kids like she can't just focus on you know this 15 year old that she just got like kind of dropped in her lap if you will but I had a lot of teachers um and that's why I have a lot of respect for teachers you know any of my um anyone who follows me knows that I've been donating my real bonuses back to schools because teachers were so helpful for me growing up um I had a lot of like support with uh my friends moms like my friends moms always like took me in kind of as their own like any of the friends you'll meet there uh I invited basically like all their moms because they've been so like important to me in my life um and then really number one's always gonna be Maddie I think she's probably like the strongest person uh, I've met her mom's been huge in my life Dela, uh, Dela's mom. I mean, really, like I said, it's, it's been a group effort for me. And I think with that, it, it's helped me realize like, yeah, you know, I had a tough relationship um, with, you know, with my parents, if you will, but that doesn't mean like that I can't improve that I can't, you know, like, I don't have to be spiteful. I don't have to be mean, you know, a lot of people who said like, oh, you have a bad relationship with your mother, you're going to be bad to women that was in my head because my father had a terrible relationship with his mother. My 
uh, parent relationship was horrible. So I'm like, oh, I don't want that for me. Right. So that was one of my biggest fears when like I met Maddie, I'm like, oh my God, this woman's perfect. Like, I don't want to mess this up. Like, like I have a bad relationship with my mom. I don't want her to know I have a bad relationship with my mom. Like what if that freaks her out? You know, thankfully it didn't, um, she's still going to marry me. But um, ultimately it was, you know, the support of all these other people in my life growing up and, and realizing like, Hey, women, women aren't all bad. Like my one experience with, with that role model, if you will, uh, wasn't great, but I have all these other experiences with, with women who had really no blood relation to me caring about me. And it's like, okay, not all women are bad. Just this one happened to not fit me so well. Right. Um, or, you know, in my dad's case, that situation, but yeah, I'd have to say it was really a group project to, to get Spencer here, which, you know, it's hard to think about because um, it's like, damn, yeah, group project. Everyone knows in group projects, one person's always doing a little bit more. Um, but thankfully, uh, Maddie from here on out is, is the one who's, who's taken on a little bit more of that role uh, of being the strong woman in my life. It's a team affair. And it I'm is. starting to pick up if we're looking for a blueprint for you, dear listener of like, let's say you have kids, right? And I think we want to have well-rounded individuals. I'm starting to pick up having examples of strong women in their life, if someone listening has a son, and then also putting them in situations where they have to interact with their fellow human in general, but also women, again, looking at sports with me and Rod, and then with uh, early uh, work experience with you, Spencer. And that's one of the goals of this podcast was like, how do we create those well rounded individuals because and, and I may be biased with this, but I think that um, creates the human that's going to be when I say successful in life, I mean more than just their career, right? In their relationships, whether they be romantic, platonic, because similar to you, Spencer, I can attest in every era of my life, and maybe you too, Rod, like I've always had like a girl space friend, like the homie who was a girl. And so that was one of those things we we're trying to get across in the pod. The other thing that you, we all were talking about before hitting record, Rod was kind of touching on this and Spencer very wisely was like, we need to, re we need to record this. How would you define emotional intelligence, Rod? And how would you compare that to the physical? Ooh. That deep question, I like that, okay. So this is what happens when you do like a hundred and some odd podcasts, you start to come up with good questions. And I appreciate I'll Venmo you for the nice, like, hey, those are great questions, I got you. <laughs> I'll talk about, okay, so how, do I, how would I define emotional intelligence? And what was the second part again? And then how would you compare that to like physical strength, like emotional strength, mental strength, you know, EQ, and how you would compare that to the physical? Because we were starting to get into, I think, a really cool and profound conversation that would be dope to talk about while we're recording. I like that. I feel like it comes from awareness and understanding. I feel like that is um, a very strong foundation that a lot of people uh, tend to overlook. And when you begin to understand, it also comes with experience, right? So when you begin to understand, um, you know, who you are and what your actions and your words and how you carry yourself and what you put out into the world, how that affects every other person, how that affects people in your life, how that affects your natural path as you go throughout life, then you begin to develop a level of, of awareness, of uh, emotional awareness, of um, intellectual awareness, um, physical awareness, physical being. And that I believe is where it comes from. And you have to be open to it in order to receive it though. So by all of us having these different experiences in our lives and how you described the type of men who we are, I feel like we have already figured out, we've already been actually like taking notes and been actively trying to um, you know, build that level of awareness. And that is why we are who we are. So that I was about to go and I was going on a deep tangent, but yeah, I, I felt that one. I felt that one. I have a follow-up question too, Rod. How did you develop that awareness and how did you develop that ability to get in touch with yourself? And, and I really loved how you said receive it as well. Cause that's something that isn't the easiest. It doesn't seem to come naturally for most people. So how did, how did you develop this awareness? So I feel that I feel that my upbringing definitely had 
uh, a large part of it. Once again, it is, um, I grew up where my dad yelled a lot. Love my dad, fantastic guy. Um, but he, he was quick to yell, like very quick. And I would always think to myself, I'd be like, damn, why are you yelling right now? I'm like, you can say the same thing in like five tones lower. And I could still hear you. You're standing right in front of me. And I always, I always grew up thinking to myself, I'm like, that seems unnecessary. And I'm like, do all men yell this way? And I grew up never as somebody, I grew up telling myself, like, I would never be like that. I would never be quick to yell. I would never be quick to just immediately go to this place of anger. And that always stayed with me. And I feel like that was a large shape of, uh, you know, why I am the way I am right now. And even to this day, in the worst, most sketchy, possible dangerous situations, I, I'm very thankful that I'm able to stay really, 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 really calm and only go to that place in, in when I know it's life or death situation. Um, the military was also a very, very big part of this where, I mean, I joined the military when I was 17, like still in high school. So it's been 15 years and I grew up wanting to be that badass. You know what I mean? Like the shit you see in the movies, you thought that combat was cool. You thought that, um, you would be, you know, downrange overseas, like, you just, like, you know, bullets going downrange and you're like patching up your battle buddy. And like, that's what a fucking man was. You know what I mean? Like, this is what we do, you know? And like, and that's what I like grew up with. You watch all the movies, die hard. You know what I mean? Like, oh my God, like, man, if I'm not like emotionally distraught and drinking just to go to sleep, then I'm not a man. Like, what the fuck is that bullshit? And then... <laughs> And then you grow older and you're like, I don't want any of that in my life. That's for the fucking yeah. birds. And when I made this transition, I went army, I went army reserve for 10 years to the national guard to active duty. Because once again, I was like, Hey, I'm mentally and physically able to do more. And I had this itch that I wanted to scratch in the special operations community. And it was a, it was a test to myself, but it was also deep down. It was, kind of like a question to my masculinity and my capability of being that tough person who I thought and I perceived myself to be. And there was a period when I came active duty that I questioned if I should be here because it put things into perspective and an understanding to myself that those things, though they may happen, and at sometimes they are necessary. And I'm talking about say like combat and defending, you know, America and your freedom and, um, you know, patching up your battle buddies. Like, yes, there is a time and there is a place for that. And that is necessary, but it shouldn't, for me, it's, it's not something that I seek out. It's not something that is now, you know, something that I need in order to like fulfill my life. So, once I, once I understood that, you know, in the last five, six years, my perspective changed and that allowed me to kind of let go of that, that, that borderline, like toxic masculinity of being like, this is what a man should be to being like, man, I can really be whoever the fuck I want to be like, and nobody can stop me. And then you find people like you guys to reinforce that. And you realize that you're onto something. Yeah. Love it. That, that also, day. looking at that as a skill set and what resonates with different people, because we're all different. We all have different perspectives. I mean, the three of us all come from a different background. Obviously, we've gotten into that a little bit. But when you were talking, Rod, it, it reminded me of conversations I've had with Dela over our fertility journey and uh, potentially having a daughter first. And it's funny, because it's so weird amongst guys, because when we said we had girl embryos, a, a few friends text me and they were kind of like, are you okay with that, bro? Like, you know, are you okay not having a, a, a son? I was like, well, one, yes, 100%, because I'm a huge Kobe Bryant fan. And he was a girl dad to the extreme. So like, yeah, I'm good with it. But I also uh, an old friend of mine messaged me who has kids. And she said that every dad in her life has been so grateful they had a daughter first because it really mellowed them out 
in terms of how they deal with their son. So it's like, if they had a daughter first, they had a son, they felt like they were better dads. And I was talking with Dayla about this because I thought it was so profound. Because I think growing up as men, we assume that it has to be this very aggressive, like, uh, you know, my dad, I've talked about on the podcast a ton. He's amazing. He also yelled. And so I was like, this is, this is what I, I need to be. And that really skewed my perspective so much so that I'm a little fearful if I had a boy first, like, like that might come out where I'm just like, bro, get it together, you know? And cause that works in sports and that works in the military. And sometimes a, a guy quote unquote needs that, but we're all different. And that can't be the normal operating mode, but it can be this sort of um, avatar that you step in to from time to time. And so I really love you bringing the military experience into that ride. Cause for real, like meeting you, spending time with you, it really blew my mind as far as, oh my God, this guy seems to be in touch with the softer side and he's been in the military for as long as you have. That's crazy. I want to sort of finish up with a question for each of us. And I'll start with you, Spencer, thinking about like a moment in your life where you're like, I did this and this is what I would define as being a good man. Okay. A good man. That see that, that, that is helpful. Cause at first I was like, I changed a tire once that felt pretty fucking manly. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm dangerous in plumbing. Like I can fix a toilet. That's manly. So yeah, let's, let's do that. That'll be fun. So first, and you answered it, your being a man is changing a tire and that's the stereotypical cliche. And then what would be your example from a, like a moment in your life and experiencing your life where that was you being a good dude, a good man. Uh, so I'm going to go like, there's, there's some things in my head of like doing things for others, but I think the best thing is, is what I did for myself. And that was really going to therapy um, that I don't want to say it saved my life. Cause I don't want to give it, ah, fuck. I could, you know, I was at a point where like, I was and this is recent. Like I was just depressed. I was bummed. I was turning into what I thought was my father, you know, and that angry yelled in a snap decision type of mindset. And I think the best thing I did as a man was go to therapy because it didn't just help me. It did impact everyone around me you know, me understanding that me being able to, you know, just be more connected with like, Hey, it's okay to be sad, or it's okay to be angry for a moment, but you don't want to live in those feelings. Those feelings are fleeting. They're going to come and go. You're not always going to be angry unless you decide to always be angry. And yeah, I got to say really for me, it was, it was there. Therapy was probably the best decision I made as, as a grown man to, to just take that leap and listen to someone for a couple of weeks or have someone listen to me for a couple of weeks and tell me like, Hey, get your shit together. <laughs> I know this because you told me about the average, but how many times have you seen a therapist now? I'll be going on seven. Um, I have another appointment for next week. And the average uh, for anyone who's wondering is actually four, four visits after a month of therapy. Most people believe that it's not working. It's this isn't for me. And they move on with their life. But just like coaching, just like so many things, you as the individual have to put that work in. You know, I went to four visits. I'll tell you right now, the first two visits were primarily me crying, because I didn't understand what was going on. And I was just throwing up information for my therapist to decipher it. And then the two visits that followed, I felt tremendous progression. And I was like, Hey, I want to come again. And that's when he said, like, you know, the average. And he told me about it. I was like, no, I want to go because it's, yes, I want to break the average because I want to be above average. But two, I know this is helping me. And it's because I'm doing the work that you told me to do. I'm putting in those practices. I'm removing particular verbiage from my life. I'm teaming up with Maddie and communicating with Maddie of like the practices I need to do, which ultimately kind of back to that question is what made me like was the best decision as a man to do because it really is not just helping me, but it's helping everyone else that, you know, I converse with and, and interact with. I love how you talked about the emotion and the emotionality during a therapy session as well, because people, when they meditate, a lot of times they'll get emotional, they'll cry. And I think it's because we freaking hide so much and we have those boundaries up. And then all of a sudden someone gives us like, Hey, <laughs> you have an hour with me. I'm the therapist. And now I'm giving you permission to stop all the distractions and really think about yourself and you're just like oh my god like i can't do this in just an hour yeah. um but i really applaud you for continuing to go huge fan of therapy here so i love that Thanks, man. rod same question so what's the stereotypical you did this and you're like i'm a man and then also the example that people might not think about of uh, this is an example of being a good dude oh god okay i mean first off if we're thinking of like stereotypical shit of what men do 
I feel like Erica, my girlfriend, is more of a man than I am because, like, I watched her take apart a wall socket the other day, and I was holding the flashlight. And I was worried the whole time. I'm like, should you be doing this? He's like, it's okay, it's okay. It's fucking positive and negative. I'm like, I, yeah, cool, whatever, cool. Um, <laughs> but I feel like, damn, okay, there is, there's no, <laughs> there's nothing, this, dude, there's nothing that makes you feel more like a man than like, <laughs> than when you land in a foreign country like Afghanistan and you have like all your fucking shit on, you got your rifle. <laughs> you got your Oakley sunglasses on and you feel like you're in a fucking movie and you're like walking off the back of the bird. You know what I mean? It's like the dust is blowing and you're just like, yeah, dude, let's fucking get him. Like <laughs> the most manly thing that I feel like I've ever done in my life. You just, you just feel like a man. You're like black hawks and shit. Fantastic. You feel so like a man. Even though I'm I think with, also real right? quick, Rod just trucked us. Like yeah. Spencer was like, I've changed the tire. Mine, I'm now like, oh God, I got to think of a better one. I'm like, so, I killed people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rod was like, I was in, like Tom Cruise was next to me. Like he landed from the, <laughs> the parachute jump and Rod was like, let's go, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> the, act the actual thing of being a man is nothing as cool, I swear to God. Um, and once again, I feel like, this is a continuous work in progress and it is like very recent, but I've been doing my best to like accept radical responsibility for my actions and my life and everything in it. And it is so hard. It is so, it's so difficult because you try to make excuses every time, like no matter what it is, like the other day, I was like, this shit bleeds over. I was like eating a steak. The steak was, this was last night. The steak is like 1400 calories, right? But hey, once again, I was fucking hungry. I hadn't eaten all day. And I'm just like, man, I'm about to go over my fat by like 60, like 60 grams. And <laughs> I'm like, maybe I just won't log it. I'm like, Rod, what the fuck? Log your shit. You know what I mean? Just like, it's, it, it is what it is. Just like accept it, understand what happened, understand the situation and be like, hey, this is life. This is what it is. Accept responsibility and move the fuck on. Um, so once again, it's always a, a work in progress, but I feel that by bringing that awareness and accepting radical responsibility, no matter what it is, then it leaves very little room for um, like self-sabotage. So. I love it. To me, I would define that as extreme ownership. The Grant Cardone book, the 10 X rule and in it, there was a moment where he said, if you get rear-ended, it's your fault. And I was listening to an audiobook as I'm driving and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Tell me more. And basically it's in, in the response there was you could have left earlier. You could have left later. You could have taken a different route. You could have slowed down a little bit sooner. You could have been in a different lane. And, and to your point, Rod, it can be scary to take that radical responsibility that extreme ownership. Cause it's like, wow, it's all on me. And I really can't make excuses, but at the same time, it's a very liberating thought and a very powerful thought of, wow, I actually have way more control and way more power than I think. So I love how you're bringing that up. So for me, just to finish this out, and yeah, I can't, God, the military, I should have gone before Rob. This is the, the yeah, manly- Sean, how do you think I feel? I said, <laughs> higher. I was making like wanna... a play, I was making a playful joke. Uh, I, just, right, that's manly. I, got, I got grease on my fingers, right? Like, yeah. And you this wanna, guy's jumping Jumping you out of No, no. I'll, you as a man, it? I'm gonna stand by my stand by my decision. <laughs> I'm gonna take ownership. <laughs> um, I would say stereotypical for me. I'm really good with plumbing, so I, I don't know how to work a car. I can barely find the dipstick for the oil. But um, with my parents, it's been weird because I, my my dad. It was just like for some reason I got really good at fixing toilets and showers. And so my entire life growing up, my parents would be like, Sean, can you fix the toilet? I'd go in and it was just me messing around and kind of like, oh, I think this is how it works and da, 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 da. And then I'd go in with a wrench and like tighten stuff. And it's really nice now if Dale is like, yo, the toilet's on the fritz. I'm like, cool, I got it. I go in. Yeah, that's my stereotypical. I actually lived for free with a friend for a summer when I was interning in LA when I was like 23. And he said, you can live here for free, bro, because I kept fixing stuff in his bathroom. So that's, that's my stereotypical, this is a man my, this is the definition of a good dude or a good man would be mentorship. And yes, I know we're both coach or all three of us are coaches and we do mentor people for a living, but 
really recognizing the things that I've had as a guy and how can I help out other people who maybe have been lacking that. So for instance, two examples, um, there's an individual, Rob Padilla, shout out to Rob. He's one of the best transformations that we've ever had. He, he just got ripped. I met him when he was in eighth grade. My ex-wife was his English teacher and he came from a community that only 40% of uh, men graduate high school, 40% of boys graduate high school. It's a rough part of Los Angeles. Um, his, he's a single mom who's working like two or three jobs to, to take care of him. And my ex-wife said, if there's anybody that's going to make it out of this place, it's Rob because he's really smart. He plays basketball and he's performing at a really high level. And she was like, you might be able to make a difference in his life. And so met him, spent some time with him, you know, growing up in LA, he was a huge Lakers fan. So like I got the Kobe Shaq Lakers, he got the Kobe Pagasol Lakers. So we really vibed on that. And then I reached out to him via text. I was like, Hey man, like, you know, I don't, don't mean to, it was just like trying to say this in a nice way, but it's like, you may not have the opportunities that I was afforded by having a nuclear family and having a strong male presence. And so feel free to use me in that way. And fast forward to now, it's really cool. I get to see him again tomorrow at ACL. He, I've written, written multiple letters of rec for him. He's, he got into college on his own, you know, got a scholarship. It's been amazing. It's been tremendous. And, and he's nice enough to really credit me with a lot of his growth. The other example is one of my brothers-in-law. So um, Dayla's parents uh, divorced when she was 12 and the siblings break down to 12, 10, eight, and six. And the two boys are the eight and six. And so when her parents divorced, her dad kind of bounced and the, you know, her mom who we've all met and love, shout out to Dara, she was single momming four kids and the two boys are eight and six. And the six-year-old who's now 26 he's gone on a similar journey as yourself, Spencer, of self-reflection and discovery of, wow, I'm starting to recognize how growing up without a dad affected me. And kudos to him. He's turned to me and Dayla's stepdad, Doug, as examples. And it's really cool because I'll get to see Dex at ACL as well. And he's a sushi chef here at a really great restaurant in town, Uchiko. And he's always very receptive to a lot of the things we talk about. And he'll ask me the softer side stuff. And he'll also ask me the harder stuff of like, I feel like I'm being disrespected at work. Like, how would you handle this? And giving him an answer that's not yelling and screaming. That's not, I'm going to throw stuff across the kitchen and actively dealing with that as a man, quote unquote. So that would be my answer as far as mentorship. And I just want to like bring this back and, and sort of wrap this up on a bow for people listening, because we're trying to come up with a blueprint for how to be a better dude. And so you have Spencer being willing to look at himself and, and maybe be scared by it with going to therapy, hiring somebody, a coach, counselor, therapist to help him. Rod really diving into radical responsibility, extreme ownership. How can I take more responsibility for my life and everything that occurs in it? And then me turning around and being like, okay, I recognize I've gotten a lot of help in my life from men and women. How can I turn around and help guys and boys and men that maybe didn't have that and really give back in that way, which I think is really cool. So thank you guys a ton for this episode. Rod, I appreciate you being down for your basically first podcast, Rod on the Pod. Rod on the Pod. <laughs> Dude, so this was, I can't wait. I can't wait to the next one. I, am, I just can't wait. Thanks for having yeah, me. Yeah, so... That's another one too, like any topics that you think would be dope to talk about or challenges or wins that your clients come across. If you're like, Sean, this would be a good podcast. You and I can hop on. We can get Spencer on and do this again. I think this would be a ton of fun. And so as we finish this up, we'll start with Rod. How can people connect with you, find you and learn more from you? Ooh, you can follow me on Instagram, Strodos, S-T-R-O underscore dose, D-O-S. Um, that is the best way feel free to shoot me a DM or comment if you have any questions. Um, and I do my best to get back to every single person. So it might take me a little bit, but that's the best way to get a hold of me. Because Rod's out there protecting our freedom guys. And so he's, he's responding to DMs when he can. And we will have your handle in the show notes, Rod. And definitely people got to reach out. Also watch his reels because his kettlebell workouts are anabolic. You, you watch that and I promise your, your lean mass will go up a percentage point. <laughs> um, I'm now smelling a second episode with you, Rod, about talking purely about kettlebells. And oh, man. Kettlebell workout. Oh, let's go. Let's bring it. I can talk for days. Let's go. We don't have that much time, but we can make it work. Oh, we will. We'll do it. It'll be a marathon podcast. It'll be fun. We can have like recurring guests. So like people pop on every now and then. That might be fun. Actually, oh, now that I, I think about it. Go. Yes. I see where you're going with that. Yes, we're going to do it. Okay, 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 okay. And then Spencer, you you are a, uh, I would say, 
recurring guest star on Shots of the Dome. So most people know how to get a hold of you, but if this is their first time listening to you, how can they connect with you and learn from you too? Very similar to Rod. Um, Spencer underscore Desiata, uh, S-P-E-N-C-E-R underscore, almost forgot how to spell my own last name, um, D-E-S-I-A-T-A. Um, just like Rod though, you know, hit me in the DMs, comments, whatever. I do my absolute best to always respond to everybody. Um, I, I genuinely like helping people. It's, it, you know, Sean, kind of similar to yours. And I, I love your take on like what it meant to be a man. I love helping people. And if that's, you know, the definition of being a man, I, I love taking on that definition. So if you ever have questions, comments, concerns, no matter what they may be, I'm always down to help out. Big daddy, real daddy in the house he remains undefeated. So we'll okay. have... We will have your handle on the show notes as well. I thank you both for spending some time with us and we'll have to do another one for sure. Most definitely. Yeah. Appreciate you. Love you guys. <laughs>